What's up? This is DJ Kenny Parker representing BDP, and I'm here on All Hip Hop. One. What's going on, world? It's your man Chuck Creekmore, a.k.a. Jigsaw. AllHipHop.com is in the building at One World Studios, and we are here with a legend, my man, Kenny Parker, and he has a new book out called my brother's name is Kenny, and it's called The World, excuse me, The Greatest True Hip Hop Story Ever Told. Yes, it is. Yeah. You know what? Um, that's Thanks not for real. Being... Thank, first of all, thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah. It's been a long time coming. And, um, you well, know. Well, first of all, let's just mention that this, is, this title is from a song. Yes. And we all know it and know the whole actual lyric. But talk <laughs> about that, that moment when you heard that. The song, the the book title is from the song My Philosophy. Right. And um, I had no idea that Chris was going to shout me out in this song. Yeah. So I'm in school and the song comes on the radio and I hear my brother's name is Kenny. That's Kenny Parker. My other brother, ICU, is much darker. And from that point on, my life changed completely. Yeah. I went from a regular college student one day mm -hmm. and overnight... I was signing autographs, people handing me their demo tapes, people <laughs> rhyming to me in the street. Wow. How, what do you think of my lyrics? I'm like, I'm going to the store to get a sandwich and you're rapping in front of me. I don't, <laughs> I'm not a music producer, but okay. Right, right. Sounds good, you know. Yeah. My whole life completely changed after that line. So I made that the title of the book because everyone knows me from that line. You know, I have to say that uh, last year or this year, Karis one dropped me in one of his songs on his most recent Yes, album. he did. Yeah. And uh, I was ecstatic because I didn't hear it at first. And people started telling me. I was like, yo, they's like, you have arrived. I was like, yes. And there was a time when a shout out was tremendously important. I yeah. mean, you you were a part of the song at mm -hmm. that point. You are yeah. a part of the lyrics to the song. Mm -hmm. So if somebody shouted you out, it, people would say this lyric to me worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere we went, but that in was the a world. hard bar too. I don't know why it was. It I don't so know hard. why it stuck it out so like that. Though. That everybody remember. I have no yeah. idea yeah. why that particular line yeah. stuck out like that in the song. But yeah. you know, he said my full name. Yeah, and he said he said Kenny <laughs> Kenny Parker. Like right. if you didn't get it, here it is. Right, right. And um, life changing for me. So what made you write this book? And you know, by the way, the greatest true hip hop story ever told. Why did you write this book and what made you subtitle it that? Well, you know, it's not really my personality to say to, to say something's the greatest true hip hop story ever told. Mm -hmm. But I'm a student of the game mm -hmm. and, I, and I study hip hop and I've watched just about everyone's story. Mm -hmm. And um, they usually go like this. I was in a gang. I sold drugs. I bust my gun. And then one day I decided to be a rapper and here I am. Right. So I'm like, okay, that's most people's stories. And then when 50 Cent came out mm -hmm. and he survived the shooting, then after that, everybody got shot after that. Right. So I'm like, okay, this is what we're doing now. Everybody's shot. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the story. So I'm like, well, nobody's telling a story from the perspective of people who grew up in the, I grew up in the same hood in New York City as everybody else. And this was a time in the 70s and 80s when New York City was the crime and murder capital of America. Yeah. And nobody told the story about the kids who grew up in that environment who weren't in a gang, who, who didn't rob people, who played basketball, sports, who went swimming, who played skelly in the street and tag. You know, mm -hmm. um, no one ever tells the story from that perspective, right. which is most of the kids in the hood are yeah. really like that. <clears throat> excuse me most of the kids in the hood are really like that they're not mm -hmm. gang bangers and, and busting their gun like people would think so i decided to tell this story and also what it took for me to come out of the hood from the situation that i was in mm -hmm. is remarkable yeah and i also witnessed my brother go from z literal zero yeah to become a rap icon. And to me, it's a miracle. Right. I actually witnessed a real miracle. Yeah. And I said, I would love to tell the people this story. No one's going to believe me yeah. when they read what I actually saw with my own two eyes. But I'm going to tell it anyway yeah. and hope I can inspire some people. Got it.
now much much you made much about how you lived in uh you know homelessness and things of that nature right but one thing you also detail is how well you had it in harlem yes um from ages three to six uh my mother and father were married and i lived in lennox terrace in harlem which was a high-rise apartment building Mm -hmm. we had a fish tank in our house we had a built-in bar built from scratch in our house we had all the toys all the clothes we had cable in 1971, cable was new. Most of Manhattan wasn't even hooked up for cable, but our building was. Right. We actually had cable in our bedroom, separate cable in our bedroom. That's crazy. We was balling. Yeah. yeah. And then the bottom fell out in my family. <laughs> my mother and father's relationship ended, and we moved to the Bronx to poverty overnight. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So... I was on YouTube and I was looking at a pioneer doing an interview and he mentioned he called Karis one out by name. Like, and he's like, and we got to stop the lies and things like that. Mm-hmm. He said he was born and or raised or something. He was in Cool Herc's building. Like he really emphasized saying that he lied about being in the building mm-hmm. when that infamous party happened or something along those lines Mm -hmm. but basically saying that you guys lived in that building did you want to clear that up yes um we did not live in the building that cool herc lived in cool herc and hip-hop was created at 1520 sedgwick avenue in the bronx our family lived at 1600 sedgwick avenue which is the next building over it's separated by a little park so we lived literally 100 feet Mm-hmm. over from Cool Herc. And on that day, August 11th, 1973, I mean, we played in front of Cool Herc's building every single day that summer. Yeah. I mean, right. it's the summer. I was like seven years old. And Chris, we were in front of Cool Herc's building every day. I guarantee you that Cool Herc probably said, excuse me to mm-hmm. us kids to get into his building because we hung out in front of his building every day. Yeah. So we were not in his building. We were next door to yeah. Cool Herc when hip hop was created. Yeah. Uh, when you when you let people, you know, when people get this book and read it and and walk away, what what's something you want them to s- take and 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 ins- be inspired by? My brother taught me that the impossible was possible. Mm-hmm. And and like I said, I used to tell him he couldn't do it. And I was the first person to tell him you are bucking. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, so, you how, know. Does a, how does a kid, the teacher, how is he a poor student? That sounds crazy to me. Actually, a poor student would be an upgrade for him. Oh, wow. He was not even a poor student. He was not even really a student. He didn't even, fi- he didn't finish the ninth grade. Wow. But really, it was really over by the eighth grade. Really? I mean, he got left back in the eighth grade yeah. and, you know, then he did eighth grade over and they had to let him out. I mean, yeah. you know, he's, you know, you're a big kid in eighth grade. It's not like his grades were better. They right. just had to let him go. Yeah. So really by eighth grade, it was over. Yeah. You know what I mean? But up until eighth grade, he didn't do anything. Like, you know, you just remember the love was going to get you. Yeah. And, you know, the first line in the song is, I'm in junior high with a B plus grade. I'm like, no, you weren't. That was my life. <laughs> right, right. I was in junior high with a B plus grade. You, yeah. You're telling my story. You yeah, know what I mean? But. Yeah. It was just funny. funny. Yeah. And that and that's the uh interesting thing as well. You both were very different in that respect. Extremely. You yeah. you were, you know, very into school. Yeah, I was yeah. a I was an honor roll student and I played sports, basketball. Yeah. And um I was straight and narrow, as you yeah. can imagine. And my yeah. brother was the exact opposite. Right. Rebellious, never did school work. Yeah. They thought he was like a a, a learning disabled child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I used to argue, he's not learning disabled. This guy is really smart. I talk yeah. to him every single day. Right. But in school, you know, he would just look out the window mm-hmm. all day. You yeah. know, so the teachers thought he was learning disabled. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm an honor roll student. Mm-hmm. And he's getting, I mean, if he got D's, all D's and F's, it'd be like, okay. That's 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 okay. You got, you know, some F's, but you got a couple D's. Like it was like that. Yeah. 
and I'll get A's and B's. And if I got one C, they're like, oh, Kenny, this is terrible. Right. You know, what are you doing? I used, to, I used to hate that. I wrote about that. I used to hate that double standard. I was like, yo, this dude is smarter than me. Right. But, you know, anyway. Nah, you, nah, you, that's could, you could tell my childhood trauma was just right, coming out right, right, there. right, right. <laughs> You know what's cool is, um, well, I'll tell you my story. Mm -hmm. I went back. K KRS came to UD, my school, University mm -hmm. of Delaware, mm -hmm. uh, several times, once as a lecturer and once as a concert that mm -hmm. I can remember. Mm -hmm. And the first time he came, he called our a diploma a receipt. <laughs> He's, I said, yo, it was ground, it was game changing. I was conflicted. I was right. like, yo, I was like, he called, he disrespecting us, but at the same time, we are paying for it. Right. I was like, yo, I don't know how to feel about this, though, right. boy. You know what I'm saying? Right. And then the second time, I actually opened for him. I was in a oh, rap dope. group. Oh, dope. And I opened for him. Um, what year was this? Like, 94. I probably was. I had to be DJ. I probably was. I was yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 94, I was in the mix. Yeah. The I'll show you the picture. Dope, dope, The dope. highlight of my career right there. Dope, dope. <laughs> but um, moving forward, uh, you also played ball with John Sally. And well, against John against Sally. against John Sally, I take that back. Um, yeah, I mean, I played. I mean, Pearl Washington. I wrote. Yeah. I wrote a lot about him. And I mean, at that point, he was the number one high school player in America, yeah. and he embarrassed me on television. <laughs> that was my first time ever being on television. Was yeah. trying to guard Pearl Washington. It was right. wasn't good. Uh, Mark Jackson. Mm -hmm. You know, back then, New York City it was a lot of guys that made it to the not a lot. A few of the top guys made it to the NBA, and I was right in the mix. I went to Abraham Lincoln High School. Right. Shout out to the Rail Splitters, and um, yeah. So I, as a high school player, I was pretty good, and we had a pretty we had we had the number one team in New York City my senior year. Wow. So um, yeah, I played against everybody back then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now um, you talk about y'all being bullied. Yes. And I said, you know, first thing I think is y'all are tall imposing right guys how how did this, how does this happen i mean we can't even fathom someone like Karis one being close right well we were tall but not imposing right okay i mean it, and chris was a little bit more aggressive than i was i was very timid uh -huh. you know i didn't want any problems yeah. and you know as you know in the hood there's two people that get all the problems if you want smoke the hood is very accommodating. Yeah. You'll get shot at, sh gangs, robberies, jail. Like, if you want the problems, the hood will give you everything. Yeah. And the other guy is the guy who wants no problems at all. Right. You get all the problems. That right. kid gets all the problems, yeah. too. Right. Because I was that timid kid who didn't want any problems. And right. you can tell as soon as I walk into a room, like, this kid don't want it. And the mm -hmm. bullies, you know, that I was like, you know, a magnet for them. Yeah. And, you know, Chris as well, not to extend it to me, but yeah, we were tall, which made people want to pick on you. Mm -hmm. We were dirty and bummy. Our hair wasn't cut. We had no money. We were just, you know, I was dark skinned. Mm -hmm. You're too dark. Yeah. It, it is every, your pants are too short. Anything you could think of yeah. that somebody would bother somebody about, I was that. Yeah. So, and I had to learn how to navigate in the hood. I had to learn the hard way. Yeah. It took me years to figure out, because I didn't have a father figure. Yeah. So it took me years to figure out how to maneuver in Brooklyn and the Bronx. Yeah. You know, but yeah, I was bullied, robbed. Yeah. Used to get robbed all the time coming yeah. outside. Like, yo, your mother sent you to the store. Yeah. You come back with no change. Yeah, right. Your mother's right. like, where's my change? Right. These yeah. dudes took my money. Right. That was like, re like regular. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your mother. Now, your mother is a a reoccurring person in the book. Yes. And, you know, there's a lot of trauma there. A lot. A lot of stories. The rice, the story about the rice yes. is one of them. Life-changing, yes. Yeah. Um, talk about your mother a little bit and, you know, how what, what her role in all of this is. And at that time and, and now, maybe... Um, as you look back, well, my mother was a single parent. Uh -huh. Um, you know, by the time she was 20 years old, she had two babies and me and Chris are only 10 months apart. Right. So they, they call us Irish twins. Okay. Yeah. You know, so we were almost the same age. Yeah. So by the time my mother was 20, she had two kids by herself. Yeah. So it was a struggle and she's trying to raise two black boys. And this is right after 
the civil rights era. You mm-hmm. know, so she grew up in the civil rights movement. Yeah. So we're right on the heels of that. So mm-hmm. she's trying to raise us very. Mil- that's one of the reasons why KRS was so militant. Yeah. Is my mother's yeah. training talking to us about life and how hard it's going to be for a black man in America. Mm-hmm. She wouldn't let us speak slang. Uh-huh. ever in the house yeah. she said you'll never get ahead talking like that right. she made us study in the summertime when school was out she made us read the amsterdam news there used to be a paper called the amsterdam news it's in still New around York. Isn't it's it? still, i don't, I I don't think know it's still around and my it's a black it was a black owned yeah. uh black themed paper right and my mother made us read that every day in the summertime. Now, you're supposed to be outside having a good time. We had yeah. to study the Amsterdam news. And when she came home from work, we had to tell her what was in it. Right. Wow. So she was a stickler for education. Yeah. And, um, but she had some troubles, you know. And, and how can I say this? She made some tough decisions. Yeah. Especially when it came to her children. And, right. um. It led me to having a tough childhood at, uh-huh. and my brother. And um, our relationship hasn't been the best, yeah. as I chronicled in the book. And our relationship hasn't really changed yeah. much over the years. I mean, yeah. her and my brother are very close, okay. the rest of my family. Um, but they have a different relationship. Yeah. You know, my brother was like the rebellious child Mm -hmm. who figured out later on that, wow, I was wild. And he came back to my mother like, you know, I was very rebellious. Yeah. I was the exact opposite. I was the kid who tried to do everything right. Right. And I got a lot of flat, uh, not flack is not the word I'm looking for. She was hard on you. Yeah. She was very hard on me and it caused a lot of problems. So I, you know, we don't have a great relationship at the, at the moment. As we speak, yeah. But um, she's around, she's you know. Around. So if you talk to my brother, he can probably give you a way better uh, uh, uh comments on her because yeah. I we have limited conversation. Right, yeah. got you. Um, how do you think, you know, there's male figures as well, uh, stepfathers. Um, uh, once again, her choices of. This is my opinion. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not a woman and I wasn't raising kids in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. I'm speaking from an adult in the, you know, now. But mm-hmm. I think, her, you know, to me, her choice of men was questionable to yeah. me. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. um, and these guys did not treat her children well at all. Right. So that was another thing. You know, we were severely abused as children. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I go into detail about that in the book, both of us. And um, actually, you know, one of her boyfriends tried to kill Chris at one point. Right. And um, so that was another thing, decisions that she made yeah. that led to, uh, you know, children. I look back on it. I don't, I, I can't even, I don't know what it's like to be a woman or raise children. But to me, I wouldn't have picked these guys. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but. Yeah. Well, we can't pass judgment, but right. um, definitely it's. It's, yeah, it's complicated. Right. Yeah, there it's it is. Complicated. It's complicated. It is what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, it made me the person I am today, which yeah. I'm very happy to have survived as a as a as a child abuse survivor. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I go into that in the book too. How you can come through child abuse, poverty, bullying, crime, and you can still escape the hood, and you don't have to be busting your gun and robbing people. Yeah. There's other ways out of the hood that people don't really talk about. And the thing is, is it's not just surviving. Like, talk, your education is something that shows up time and time again. And I didn't even know that about you. Tell right. people. Like, yeah, I, I graduated from college with a bachelor's degree in psychology. Yeah. Um, I received the athletic scholarship, um, which yeah. is very rare to get. And despite all of all the things that were going in my in my home as a teen, including homelessness. Yeah. As a teen, I still managed to get an athletic scholarship and then go to college and graduate. Yeah. Um, which is something I'm very proud of. Got your of. receipt. I got my receipt. <laughs> hang on the wall. Thankfully, I didn't have to pay for it. So is right, it really right. a receipt? It's yeah. like a, I don't know, uh, what you call it, invoice? Right. I don't, I don't right. Right. It's not a receipt because I didn't pay. Right. Shout Indeed. out to all the people paying for college because college tuition is real. Yeah. By the way, I had a scholarship too. You know. A merit scholarship, which is not actually based on academics, because I was black. But I took it. 
extremely difficult. If you can get a scholarship to any college yeah. in America, it's extremely difficult. Yeah. Take advantage of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, how was how was college for you? Like, what was that experience like? Was it was it fun? Were you mean at the same time, Karis? One is you know a megastar at right. this point. Well, my first couple of years of college is before BDP. You know, I was playing ball. I was playing well. Mm -hmm. um, college was great. I actually found myself in college. You know, I, I found who I was. I came in there as an 18-year-old, straight out of bed, star Brooklyn. Yeah. And I went to uh, St. Peter's University. Shout out to St. Peter's University for making the greatest basketball run in NCAA history last That's year. Oh. Went from 15 seed all the way to the Elite Eight. I got to shout out my school okay. last year. I felt like a proud parent right, right, watching right. the whole thing. Um, but um, college for me was great. I got to meet people from other walks of life. Mm -hmm. And I found out that I had more in common with these kids than I did with the thugs in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. And then my brother comes out with music. So in the midst of this, I'm 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 Kenny. I'm a college student. I do you know term papers, homework. And then my brother's name is Kenny. That's Kenny Parker. And yeah. then the next day, right, I'm signing autographs. Right. People are giving me their demo tapes. I'm swamped. I go to the store and they're like, yo, what are you doing in the supermarket? Right, I'm like, right. I'm getting some bread like I did yesterday. Right, right. When nobody knew who I was. Yeah. Now, and I'm still like, who was? Who I, I'm KRS's brother, but that's like, to me, that's like seventh on the amount of things I think I am. You know, right. I'm a student. I'm an athlete. I'm a this or that, that. Yeah. I happen to be my brother. happens to be KRS one, but to everyone else, that was the number one thing and nothing else. Yeah. So I had to adjust to that. But, you know, it, it was a little adjustment for me. But, you know, college was great for me. Yeah. Um, I suggest anyone, you know, if you have a chance to go to college, give it a shot. It's not for everybody. Yeah. Try it out and see. My daughter tried to say that to me the other, a couple of weeks ago. It's not for everybody. I said, yeah, it is. It's for everybody. You too. You know what I mean? I like, know what. you know what I'm saying? I said, y'all say that because you don't want to do the work. I didn't want to say it like that. <laughs> nah, man. I know it's you know, <laughs> too hard out here. I mean, let's keep it a buck. If you go to college, you 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 probably gonna have a baseline lifestyle. Yes. Right. If you don't go and you don't have a trade or you don't have a skill or you can't scam like or something, you know what I mean? It might be hard for you out Extremely here. Extremely difficult to make it in in the in the world without. Even with a college degree, yeah, absolutely, it's tough to get a job. Yeah. But if it comes against you and someone else, and they have a college degree and you don't, you yeah. definitely lost. Yeah, I mean, and I think college to me also shows a college degree shows that you finished. Yeah, you no, know, it's true. not even so much about what you majored in; it's the fact that you went and you completed. It shows the world or an employer that you will stick with yeah. something yeah. to the end. That's a fact, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, college over a high school diploma versus a college diploma is really like night and day to yeah. me. Um, it doesn't ensure success, but you need every little bit. Yeah. And this world is tough. It's a tool. A tool yeah, it's another tool yeah. in your belt yeah. that you can pull out. And the right. more tools you can pull out, yeah. the better you are, because this world is tough. Yeah, definitely. So I have to ask you, you know, Criminal Minded came out, what year was that? 80, 87. 87. And the cover is telling. They've changed the cover over the years, by the way. I didn't know that. So, you know, the, 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 a lot of the, the strap, you, right. know, you know what I mean? They right. Photoshopped that off oh. now. Yeah. So, but back then, that album cover said a lot. First of all, that was the hardest album cover in music history at that point. I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You right. have never seen yeah. guys on the cover of an album holding guns yeah. with bullets strapped across yes. their body, with a grenade absolutely. on the table, and the title, Criminal Minded. Absolutely. So they weren't saying we're Western. This is not a Clint Eastwood movie. Right. We're criminal minded two black guys with guns you yeah. had never seen anything like that i think if they weren't on an independent label that couldn't have come out no, like that a major label not. would have never put that out that's unheard of yes. i don't think even not even ice t was on it like that yeah i mean he got on 
not no. He had, I think, a cartoon guns. I think I remember if I remember. Oh yeah, his logo was a cartoon. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't like the criminal mind. Not in eighty seven. That that was. So we're gonna say this. That was the hardest album cover at the time, and it's definitely top five hardest album covers of all time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it might be number one, but we're not gonna. We won't say that yet. You can argue that. I mean, yes. It's very close. So we'll we'll decide that offline but let's just say top five so this album drops now do you know this is do you know this is happening like there's even songs before that you know there's stuff before that but what what are what's going on with you in in your relationship to all of that well it was levels i mean you know i watched my brother go from trying to rap he wasn't even krs yeah to making tapes to South Bronx comes out and you know I I couldn't believe <laughs> that my brother made a record. I mean, at that point it was so hard to make a record mm-hmm. and get a record deal. Yeah. And to me, where we came from, nobody even knew anybody who made a record. Right. I mean, these people weren't even humans. Like if you was yeah. on the radio or on television, you weren't even like a real person. Yeah. I mean, I, I give you an example. Remember the singer D Train? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Notorious B.I.G. sampled his song, Sky's the Limit, and you know that uh-huh. you keep on, just keep on pressing on. It's right. got D Train. Yeah. He's from Brooklyn. Okay. Back in 81, a friend of mine knew D Train's cousin. Okay. Not D Train, mm-hmm. D Train's cousin. Mm-hmm. And we were all like, Wow, you know D Train's cousin. D Train's cousin was a superstar to right. us. Yeah, that's about as close as we ever got to knowing someone who actually was on the radio was the cousin right. of Forget D Train. If you had to introduce me to D Train's cousin, I would have been like, Oh my God, you D Train's cousin. Right. Actually, the person who told me they knew D Train's cousin was somebody, right? Because you knew the yeah. cousin of right, D Train. Right. That's where my mind was at. Regular people don't make music, and mm-hmm. definitely not us. Yeah. So when my brother comes out with a hit record, that guy, mm-hmm. the home that was homeless, ran from home multiple times. Mm-hmm. I couldn't believe it. And then I thought he was going to be a one-hit wonder. I don't like to use that term, but I thought that Sal, he had one good song, mm-hmm. South Bronx. And I used to like MC Shan. I, I liked MC Shan. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the first time I heard South Bronx, I, I wrote about it in the book. The first time I heard South Bronx, I called him. I was still in school. And I said, uh, I heard your song on Red Alert. You know, first of all, Red Alert played your record. You were a star. Yeah. There was no daytime radio. Yeah. If Red Alert plays your song two weeks in a row, that was a hit record. Yeah. I said, Joe, I heard your record on Red Alert. Sounds like you're dissing MC Shan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I am. And my exact words were, are you sure? Shan is dope. And he said, he's all right, like that. And I'm like, Shan is not all right. Shan was dope in 86. Mm-hmm. So when Shan answered the South Bronx, I thought it was over. Right. I was like, damn. And I saw because I was like, I told you. This is what I'm telling him. <laughs> I told you not to mess with Shan. I told you. And I was like, you know, like, damn, man. Like you, but you had South Bronx and it right? was great, you know. Your brother, I love you. Yeah. This is great. This is how I'm talking yeah, to him. Like, yeah. this is the beginning of the end. Oh and <laughs> so he goes, I got the answer already. Oh, right. And this is like a week after Shan had dropped Kill That Noise, which yeah. is the answer to South Bronx. I'm like, you already got the answer. How does it go? This is how I'm talking. Yeah. How does it go? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's the relationship. that we, How does it go? And he says, um, well, it's to a reggae beat. Mm-hmm. And you know the beat, the bass line goes doom, doom, do 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 do. I'm like, oh, that's whack. Your career right. is over. Right. Right. <laughs> <That's> right. <it. laughs> so he's like, he started laughing. Right, right. He's like, I'm gonna do it tonight at Union Square. Just come to Union Square. I'm gonna do it tonight. Mm. I'm like, all right, I'll come to Union Square. Yeah. You know, whatever. Yeah. So we get to Union Square. I seen him perform before a couple times in there doing South Bronx, which to me was amazing. He comes out. He starts doing his song, South Bronx. And you can hear people in the crowd going, kill that noise. Mm-hmm. Kill that noise. And I'm like, 
Oh, and this, this is my right, worst right, nightmare. Right, right. Oh, and then Chris starts going, what? Say it louder. Kill that noise. What? Say it louder. Right, I'm like, right, right, what are you right. doing? And so now D-Nice, who was on stage with him, shout out to my man D-Nice, uh -huh. BDP brethren. He starts chiming in, say it louder. Yeah. So now it's kill that noise. I'm like, this is, why are you encouraging him to diss you? Then he stops the music. He says, Scott LaRock, stop that. He says, I got something for all the MC Shan fans out there. Hit it, Scott. And he throws on the beat. Mm -hmm. Doom, doom, tap, tap, doom, tap. And, and, like, da -da 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 -da. and you're like, what is this? Because yeah. at that time, reggae and hip hop had never really mixed before. Right, right. So you're like, is this reggae? It, the beat's hard. Then you hear doom, 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 doom. And I'm like, oh, that's the bass line you're trying to tell. But it like sent a chill down your back because it's like boom, boom, boom. And the whole crowd is like, what is this? Yeah. And then he said, the bridge is over. The bridge is over. Bye bye. Right. <laughs> no. Chuck. Oh, my God. I lost it. Everybody in the crowd lost it. I couldn't believe it. That's my brother. Right. We used to argue over socks. Right. <laughs> he just came with some style I never heard before. And then he starts, Mr. Magic sucking, Roxanne Chante stuff. That. And I'm like, no yeah. one had never disrespected anybody like this before, yeah. ever yeah. in a record. This is the hardest record ever coming yeah. out. Yeah. And so that blew my mind. Right. But the skeptic in me, Okay, Chris, you got two songs. <laughs> oh, no. So now, you know, he comes to me and he's like, I'm working on an album. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, me, you mean a real album with like your picture on the front? Like, that's yeah, what I yeah, said yeah, to yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, it's called Criminal Minded. Okay, that right. sounds dope, you know. But now, you know, I, I realize he's a dope MC, but I still had no idea. Yeah, right. You know, and then he's like, "Okay, he gave me a cup. He gave me a rough copy of poetry. Okay, yeah, which was like a third style. He might yeah. be South yeah. Bronx was one. Yeah. It's almost like different MCs were subbing into the game. It's yeah. like South Bronx was one MC. Yeah, sub. He comes out. Yeah. This guy does the bridges over. Yeah, he sub. He comes yeah. out, and then another guy comes in and does poetry. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, this is now I'm thinking to myself, okay, something is going on here. Right. You know, I'm I'm such a skeptic. It took me all and now I'm like, okay, yeah. you know, something is going on here. Right. And then when the album came and I heard everything, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is this I think I think this is a masterpiece yeah. that he made. Definitely. And you know, eventually the whole world did too. Yeah. But then I'm still like, okay, so you got oh, one man. album. Oh. It's like <laughs> you got this dope album. <laughs> But you know, you remember then then Scott gets killed. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, people was like, you know, BDP is a lot of people thought BDP was over. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that, but you know, I'm like, you know, what are you gonna do now? Mm -hmm. And you know, he's like, I'm gonna continue on the legacy. So now I believe that he's a dope. You know, at this point, he's an elite MC. Yeah. But you still don't know, like, you know, what are you gonna do? You got more songs. Yeah. And then my philosophy comes out, and then mm -hmm. I hear my brother's name is K. So then by that point, I'm like, oh, yeah. K yo. Yeah, yeah. My, my philosophy might be my favorite song. That record was huge, yeah. and, and it came at the perfect time because MTV Raps just yeah. broke. And I was mad they cut the cut the video a little bit, if yeah. you remember that. Yeah, they cut it short. This is the acapella, and they cut yeah. it short, yeah, I guess for time. Yeah. Um, shout out to Fab Five Freddy. Um, mm -hmm. for directing that. Um, so yeah, it took me to answer your question. I was a long winded. No, that was beautiful. <clears throat> um, to answer your question, it took me sections mm -hmm. to get to, to believe, to really believe from where we came from. It's so unbelievable. I still, I still to this yeah. day am shocked at all that my brother has managed to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. And almost, you know, Karis one is, is, is different. For mm -hmm. me, than my brother Chris, you know, mm, right? Karis One is that guy over there who performs and does all this stuff. But my brother Chris, you know, our bond is different. Yeah. So I still find it unbelievable. Yeah. But at that time, 
you know, and, and hip hop was new. I mean, it was just, everything was just so new. The sound sampling, what is this? Like, yeah. you know, yeah, you can take a James Brown record and, and do like It was just all yeah. so new and fresh. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of that, what, how would you classify your relationship? You know, you guys are close in age, closer than I thought, actually. Yeah. I'd never, he's the younger one. I'm no, I'm the younger. You're the younger. I'm the younger. See, all this time I thought you were the older. No, one. Chris Maybe. is the Chris is the older brother. Oh, now it makes sense. Now yeah, it makes sense because he, you know, when you say rebellious, da 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 da, da you know, I think of myself. I think of my brother and me. Right. And I'm like, how the younger one be more rebellious? That don't make no sense. No, but he's the older. He's the brother. oldest, but slightly, slightly. You know, and here's the thing, you know, that people might find surprising. When we were growing up, I was the lead. I was the one right. who had all the friends. Right. I was the one who said, you know, I'm playing basketball. Come play ball with me. Chris started right. playing ball because I played ball. Okay. I played Skelly. He played Skelly because I played Skelly. I okay. was the lead. Like, even the guys who he made tapes with were mm -hmm. my friends right. from school. Like, I right. hooked him up with everything was evolved around me. Got you. Until hip hop came and then the Copy. relationship switched. Okay. And then he became the lead. Okay. And I became I started following him everywhere. Yeah. And his friends happened to be people who made records. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Also, you know, this is my boy Chuck D. Right. You know what right. I mean? right <laughs> Instead right. of, you know, my boy would be, you know, Money Mike from the right. Runaway. <laughs> you know, his boy is uh, Biz. Yeah. You know right, what I mean? Right, right. So that that's how our relationship switched. But I, my relationship with Chris is um, like I said, I'm always on his back. I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, I was his first hater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going mm -hmm. back to kids and uh, we argue for, about hip hop. We've been arguing about hip hop since day one. Well, what yeah. don't y'all agree on? Or what do y'all clash over? What and hip hop? Yeah. The relationship goes like this. First of all, Chris likes, out to me, offbeat stuff. Okay. And a relationship always, this is how it goes. I'll get some music. Yo, Chris, listen to this. Mm -hmm. That's whack. <laughs> no, it's not. Right. And here we go. Right. See, to him, it's he has it's either the greatest thing you ever heard, classic that will let, stand the test of time, or it's trash. Right. Right. To me, there's a middle. Yeah. Some things aren't the greatest thing I ever heard in my life, but it's pretty good. Yeah. You know, yeah. some artists they're pretty good. They're not. You know, a rock and roll hall of fame. Yeah, but they, you know, they they made right. a good song. He doesn't look at it like that. His okay. thing is, what style did he use? <laughs> Listen to those syllables. Right. He right. didn't put this word with this word. And I'm saying it just sounds good and it's moving. Yeah. Nah, 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 nah. Right. So this is the arguments that we've had. So okay. most of the time, it is me trying to convince him that something okay. is dope. Every once in a while. He'll like something or he'll be up mm -hmm. on something first and I don't like it. Got it. I'll tell you a funny story. I, okay. I, I'm, I'm going on. We did a show in 94. Mm -hmm. It was BDP and the Fugees. Okay. Shout out to them. Mm -hmm. This when they had this is when they had nappy heads out. This is before the, the boom bath. The yeah. uh, boom bath. Yeah, ever. yeah. And we have a section in our show where we'll throw in a beat. Chris will do some freestyles. Mm hmm so who was in the audience that day? One of the Wu-Tang Clan members, Old Dirty Bastard. Okay. Happened to be there. Yeah. So we throw on the beat. Come on up, ODB. Rom. ODB comes up. He grabs the mic. And he starts going. Ooh, baby, I like it raw. Ooh, baby, I like it raw. And he's singing Ooh. like that. I'm like, uh, what the <laughs> hell? So after the show, we get address with him. I'm like, yo, Chris, did you see ODB? That shit was so whack. That was terrible. Right. Chris is going, no, that shit was dope. That style was right. so dope. Right. I'm going, are you kidding? Were we watching the same thing? That right. shit was terrible. We're going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a year later. Yeah. ODB's albums drop. Right. Then he, ding, 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 ding. Oh, baby, I like it, bro. Right. Explosion. That's yeah. probably his signature song. Yeah, yeah. I was wrong. Right. And of course, Chris will bring this up. Remember when you didn't like ODB? Blah, blah, blah. I couldn't, I couldn't hear, I could not hear. Oh, baby, I like it. I could not hear that. Yeah. So right. th this is like the kind of arguments that Got me it. and him will have. 
over yeah. hip hop. And it's been going back to 78, 79, yeah. to now, to right, right now. Right, right, right. Right. Um, you, in the book, you detail being homeless. Um, mm-hmm. His story of homelessness is, is well documented. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you say you guys, I mean, that's, you know, sometimes I, I think, oh, if I was homeless, would I, you know, outside of you guys, I, right. would I be able to do it, you know? Because I'm, I'm a middle class kid, so right. I, I always like to think that I have the fortitude to, right. to do that. Right. I never quite get to the answer. Like, how, for you, how did you feel like you managed to overcome it? Well, first of all, for me, uh-huh. being homeless was traumatic and what, probably the worst experience of my life. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I was a teenager. Yeah. I don't think I could have managed Mm -hmm. except that I had my brother with me who was already a veteran of homelessness by 16. Right. He had been in the streets on and off for years at this point. Right. Right. So he kind of held my hand like I got you Mm -hmm. in this. Yeah. Until I was able to get back in the house. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a whole crazy story in, in the book. But um, it, it, homelessness is very difficult. Yeah. And, you know, it made me look at my brother even more strangely because, you know, he used to run away from home and, and be out in the streets for weeks and months. And But I didn't know what homelessness was like. Yeah. But when I got a taste of it... Mm-hmm. I was like, I cannot believe that you run out, that you you choose to do this, to go out in the streets like this. I mean, it was winter time. We were sleeping on the train. And I cannot believe that you choose, you choose this. I was dying. I was scratching on the door trying to get back in the house. (laughs) And he chose to be out there. Yeah. And, you know, so I just look at this guy is just bugged out. Yeah. And that's why, I, like, that guy lectures in Harvard and Yale now. <laughs> and it's like, I, it, it's almost like I witnessed a miracle. Yeah. And it's like, I want to tell the people, like, I saw an absolute miracle mm-hmm. before my eyes. And I, I, I want to tell everybody what I saw. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's what made me write the book. It's like, it's unbelievable right. to see him go from this, me and him sleeping on the train, to this. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. One thing I want to talk about is, um, and I don't know exactly where you understand this part, but Scott LaRoe, yeah, um, his passing was the, it was like catastrophic for for, yeah. for, for, for everybody, for everybody. But 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 you guys were so you know he was so integral to hip hop at that time, and and obviously Boogie Down Productions, and maybe you know as a family uh, uh, or residually, if you will. You, I'm not sure where where did you, you know, what were your thoughts on it, and what did you think when that happened? Well, How did you feel? Well, first of all, I I was around Scott a few times, oh, yeah. but I was also in school. Yeah. So at this point, I used to come back and forth, back and forth. You know, I was like, I wasn't in BDP, but I was around. Yeah. Like you know, BDP was two factions. Mm-hmm. It was Scott LaRock and his crew, which was D Nice, uh-huh. Willie D. Uh-huh. I think manager Mo. These guys were Scott LaRock's people. Yeah. And then there was the KRS people, which was Miss Melody, ICU, me. Uh-huh. I wasn't in the group, but I was in. I was orbiting the group. Yeah. So I was around Scott a lot when they did stuff. I was in the studio with him and everything. Um, Scott was the leader of BDP. Yeah. The clear leader. Okay. Um, Chris always compares him to um. Scott being his Morpheus, mm, you know, wow. the, the, the person who, you know, Nature. said you are the one. Right. And, you know, yeah, he, he, he likens Scott to that. Wow. And um, if you go, if you look at old, if you ever look at some footage on YouTube or stuff of old BDP interviews from the 80s, if you notice Scott did all the talking. Mm-hmm. Karis One used to play the back. Now, knowing Karis one now, it's shocking to see him in the back. But if you go back and look, Scott used to do BDP is this. We're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing this. He was the leader of the group yeah. and an overall cool guy. Yeah. But when, so when he passed, which was devastating how it happened and mm. devastating for D-Nice, you know, that was like his father. Yeah. Um, But also it put 
all, everything on Chris's shoulders. Right. So it was it was devastating for BDP, right. but it made everyone step up. D Nice became the DJ. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris became the leader. Shout to Scott LaRock. I mean, it was a yeah. tremendous loss because he was a visionary, and yeah, he sure. wanted to be a producer, manager, record owner. Mm -hmm club booker like yeah. he had dreams of doing it all so yeah. it's a terrible tragedy we've seen d nice in several versions of him rap you know pro, um, dj producer rapper mm -hmm. and then for for some of us you know in the industry we saw him evolve into photographer this right. kind of a renaissance right dj again and now he's just like on top of the world the biggest dj in the in the world probably d yeah. nice is the biggest dj yeah. in the world um I'm so happy for D. I mean, I met him as a little, as a 15 year old. Yeah. Um, and uh, Scott would be proud of him, you know, mm -hmm. cause that was the vision. I mean, the vision was for D nice to always go solo, yeah. and, you know, and Scott and Chris, but Scott was grooming him for that yeah. to go solo and be your own guy. So to see him take Scott LaRock's energy and take it to the top, mm -hmm. um, Shout to him. I'm nothing but proud of him. Yeah. You know, and it's BDP. It's a BDP tree. He's took, yeah. he's took it there. Definitely. Yeah. Chris taught me, and I, and I wrote about it in a book, how no matter where you are in life, in your situation, uh -huh. you can still get to a goal if you believe that uh -huh. you can do it. You have to believe that it's possible. Right. And even when people that's close to you, like your family, is telling you it's impossible, mm -hmm. you're closest at that point. This is, I was Chris's closest friend. Yeah. He had no friends. Right. All his friends were my friends. Right. I'm his brother telling him, you're bugging. <laughs> <laughs> and even with that, right. he right. still believed. You have to believe that, that things are possible. Yeah. And, and it can be possible. Yeah. It's crazy. When did you start DJing? Uh, you, and, 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 and are you the first hip hop? You know, I just remember using your real name, DJ Kenny Park. I was like, why didn't he use a name? Like, why your real name, first of all, were you the first? And thirdly, you know, how did you just start DJing? Was it? You know what? I'm going to go out on a limb, first of all, okay. and say I was the first DJ to use his real name. I think so. Kenny Parker is my government name. Right. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. Okay. Somebody might challenge that and find right. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. Okay. And the reason Chris named me DJ Kenny Parker, by the way. Okay. Actually, I had no idea I was even going to DJ for BDP. It all happened so fast. It was like a fluke. Um, I started DJing in the end of eight, 1989. Okay. Um, I was staying, I just graduated from college and I was staying at Chris's house and he had a music room in his apartment with every record. He used to buy everything. Yeah. And he had inherited uh, all of Scott LaRock's records mm. from Scott's mother. So he had thousands and thousands of records in this room and turntables, the whole setup. And Chris is a DJ, yeah. by the way. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know, he did a lot of scratches on his album, even My Philosophy, where it goes, so you're a philosopher? Yes, 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 that's KRS wow. okay. scratching that. Okay, so I wanted to learn- Where's that from, by the way? It's from a old, actually I had a break album I put on. It's from an old church, there's a church album. Okay. With a bunch of, uh, sermons recorded live oh okay and in the beginning of one of them it's like eight the a side has like eight and the b side has like it's just like 16 sermons right on right. one of it one of them it starts so you're a philosopher and the guy goes yes i think very deeply and then he goes on and on and on and on right, and he starts right, just right. talking about all kind of stuff <laughs> so chris takes that piece i think very deeply and he, right, just, right. And he just took i still have that record what? by the way i have the original one that he used yes. i jacked chris for everything Ooh. all of the old classic Ooh. records and stuff that he used i jacked all of that i've been jacking chris since day <laughs> one i took jackets right. i got the bdp hat that he wore on the cover of balmy necessary what? album oh, that beat the leather i still have that hat jack straight oh, jacking man. ice cube said straight jacking you gotta donate that to the uh universal hip-hop i Museum. do i really need to it's real <laughs> beat up they're gonna have to fix right, it up right, but right. no i'm sorry go ahead no 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 
the leather from Jack of Spades. Woo! And and also self destruction, by the way. But go ahead. I go might ahead. have had the leather from Jack of Spades too. Ooh. I don't have it now, but I might have had it at one point. Okay. I would just go to I would go to Chris's house and just you know, you know I took turntables, to wow. SP twelve hundred speakers. Shirts, hats, like yo, yeah. I'm I'm your little brother. Come on, I'm, yeah, I'm in here. But crazy. um, yeah. So I wanted to learn how to DJ, okay. just to make my own mixtapes, mm-hmm. so I wouldn't have to wait for Red Alert to record. Because mm-hmm. you remember back in '88, '89, hip hop came on one time per week mm-hmm. on the mix shows. If you didn't catch hip hop on Friday and Saturday nights. You had to wait all the way to the next Friday, Saturday night to catch your songs if right. you didn't record it. Yeah. So Chris had all the records. So I was like, show me how to DJ so I can just make tapes. Yeah. So he said, okay, he showed me the basics. And I started every day just practicing, making tapes in my Walkman. And at this time, I was traveling with Chris on the road just doing uh, like a roadie, basically. Just uh-huh. doing production assistant work and, and just carrying stuff. And then D Nice went solo. Uh huh. And so BDP needed a DJ. Yeah. And I had been DJing only two months. Right. At this point. Yeah. But um, I knew the show back and forwards. Right. And I was right there. Yeah. So Chris kind of just slid me right into the BDP. Like I skipped a lot of steps. I went from practicing in his music room to DJing in front of thousands of people right. overnight. Yeah. And then he was like, okay, you're going to be the permanent DJ, and now you're DJ Kenny Parker. Because everybody knew me. From, my brother's name is Kenny. Yeah. So I went from my brother's name is Kenny Parker to DJ Kenny Parker. Right. Literally overnight. Yeah. So, and then from that point on, I just ran. You right. know, it's been right. over 30 years now. but That's crazy. Yeah, but that's how it happened, just like that. Did that ever, did you ever clash with D-Nice? Was there ever any, you know... No, as a matter of fact, D Nice, I, I wrote about this as well. I'm, I'm giving away a lot, but I'm, I'm just gonna go there. It, you can't possibly. It, it's too much. It's so much in there, yeah. but I'm gonna give this little this little piece away. But it's just a small piece. But D Nice was the one who was suggested that I become the DJ. And mm-hmm. um, we were at the Apollo about to do a show, and I was setting up. I used to set up the equipment, and D Nice was like, "You know what would be dope." If you had your brother up there, yeah. two brothers up there rocking, wow. that would be dope. That was D Nice who oh, said that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Chris's first reaction was, Yeah, but Kenny would have to be dope. I'm not just gonna put him up on my set or not. You know, Chris is like, right. oh hell no, BDP is the greatest, you know. Yeah. You know how Chris is. So um so D Nice was the one who suggested that. So it was never any, you know, beef like that. And D Nice was going on to have a number one hit record. My name is D Nice. Mm-hmm. So he was on his way, you know, yeah. to 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 solo stardom. So we've never had a problem. I mean, I was with D Nice um, three weeks ago. Okay, we was yeah. hanging out in in uh, on forty on Fourteenth Street in front of a pizza shop at two o'clock in the morning, wow, just eating crazy. and laughing. That's it's dope. like three weeks ago. That's dope. That's dope. Um, I want to show people the back cover. <laughs> That really captures our. That's a reason yeah. I put that there because that really captures our relationship. <laughs> that could be any number of conversations, right, <laughs> right there, from what's going on the show to I uh, think so and so sucks and you don't to right anything. That could be yeah. anything right there. That's what in this one too. I mean, I just feel it's just classic, classic. Um, what's you know life like for you nowadays? Like, are you still DJing? Are you like what's what's? Yes, um, I still DJ in New York City every week. I DJ in a couple of clubs in uh, Lower Manhattan. Um, I just started a YouTube channel, okay, because I wanted to tell more stories. I, yeah. you know, I have a ton of stories. Yeah, you know, I've been the man next to the man mm-hmm. for over thirty years. Yeah, and you know, when you're in this position, most people don't even know you're there. Right. Right. I was standing right there for so many things, but people were so focused on Chris, they don't even see me. Yeah. Even some of my friends really? th- were coming to a place and not even, I'm six foot six and they wouldn't even see me. They, right, they didn't right, see right. Chris so much. So I was standing there for so many things. So once again, I'm like, I want to tell people all of these things that I saw because it's hilarious. You know, my, my first entry, I did the, I broke down the whole PM Dawn incident. Mm-hmm. You know, the legend. Were you there? I was DJ. I was there the you whole were- time. Ooh. So you know, I went. <laughs> uh, I went to great detail on right. um 
on YouTube on my YouTube channel. Okay. okay. Uh, well, tell people your YouTube channel, by the way. What's it? DJ Kenny Parker okay. right. on on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I'm DJ Kenny Parker. I I, I broke down the whole PM Dawn thing because I was part of the planning. The execution, Ooh, the planning committee, the after work. Because you know, I see a lot of people have stuff online. They talk yeah. about it. A lot of it is misinformation. Yeah, that didn't happen like that. This didn't happen like that. Okay. So I'm like, let me let me tell the whole story. Okay, okay. And I broke it down. So yeah, you know, I, I want people to watch it. So right. I'm gonna say, okay. just go. Okay, go to his channel. Go to, my channel go to his channel. On YouTube. <laughs> I would. <laughs> Next time I come, I'm gonna break it down for Chuck. But it, that was a great. That was one of the, my craziest nights ever in hip hop. Yeah. And the wildest I've ever seen a crowd in my life. I'm just going to say that I've seen I've done over a thousand shows with Karis one mm -hmm. DJ. That's the number one mm -hmm. wildest crowd I've ever mm -hmm. seen was the night that PM Dawn was thrown off the stage. Rest yeah. in peace to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I had mixed feelings when that happened. As most people did. I had very mixed feelings. On one side, I'm like, yeah, we don't rock with that group like that. Now, in hindsight, they weren't that bad. Right. 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 But at that time, we didn't rock with them right. like that. And secondly, he was the stop the violence man. I go exactly into okay. that. And de everything he just said, Chuck, I go into detail about all that. And it's true. Okay. I'm just going to say in a, in, a, in a nutshell, it did not go down the way it was supposed to. Okay. What happened that night was not how it was playing. It was a it was a small plan that what we were gonna do, Chris wanted to go there and battle him was what it was supposed okay, to be. Got and it. everything that happened after that was circumstances based on other people that were there. Yeah. You know, once you put certain people in a room, yeah, they're gonna wild out. Was just ice there? Of course he was. <laughs> just to say just ice was there, y'all already know. Just to say for those that don't know, just I shout out to my man Justice. He's the original hip hop Debo Fridays. Remember how Debo used to come? Everybody used to go, here comes Debo. Right. Just Ice was Debo. Right. And he's a a, 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 a BDP affiliate. Him and Chris go back to the shelter. They met in the shelter mm, okay. around the same time as Scott. Right. Got and it. Just Ice was a wild dude. Oh, he was still. one of the guys who was there. So I'm just going to leave it at that leave so y'all can imagine how things right. started and how it turned based on that. Say less. Love Just. Shout I, out to Just. I just interviewed Just yeah, uh, saw that. Ice a few weeks ago. Love that dude. Man, gave us some great YouTube numbers, but more importantly, great guy to listen to. Yes. I mean, he had so much to say. I definitely had to um, link back up with him. But I used to love all that whole era. I mean, Just Ice, KRS. I mean, actually, the whole 80s is just so lit. And it's so, so underrated now because, they, you know, they say the golden era started at 88. I hate that. Yeah. I hate, hate, hate that when people say the golden era was 89. So I'm like, yo, 87, yeah. 86 yeah. was off the yeah, hook. Definitely. Absolutely. And, you know, for a person like me who was in Latin quarters in Union Square, mm -hmm. shout out to all those heads. You, you had to be there, man. It was right. like, it was like. It was like a, a, a grooming school right, right. for all of the people that was coming up. It was an incredible time. And hip-hop was so new. Everything was brand new. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's it's crazy to me um, for KRS-One to be, you know, the age he is and to still be cranking out albums. And uh, you may not get the most recognition, but if you listen, the bars are just Ridiculous. Silly. They're crazy. Still, I listen to the new album. Shout out to Chris. Yeah. I am an MC, are you one too? I think is what mm -hmm. it's called, I, 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 the mm -hmm. acronym. Still at this age, but you know what? Care, he says I am hip hop and Chris coined that phrase back in 92. And when he said it at the time, it was a lot of controversy. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of MCs came, came after him. And what do you mean you are hip hop? Who do you think you are? They didn't understand the concept. But when Chris says I am hip hop, he really is hip hop. That's all he ever wanted to do with his life and I, I i hope that i convey that in the book there was nothing there was no plan b there was nothing else mm -hmm. that he ever wanted to do mm -hmm. but to be hip-hop and he's gonna rhyme until the wheels fall off yeah. for yeah. him um hip-hop turns 50 next, next year, year yeah. that legendary party we won't debate all the um there's a lot of debate about 
other places and people even that right. may have preceded that. But let's just talk about um, August 11th, 73. Um, wh- what, what are your thoughts on sort of legacy wise and currently hip hop? Well, hip hop, I think, is the most influential music ever created. Mm-hmm. Outside of maybe African music, when they passed on yeah. the, le- the the stories from generation to generation. Mm-hmm. Hip hop did that too. Hip hop was the first social media. Mm-hmm. We were able to tell, we had no other outlet mm-hmm. yeah. but to talk on record about what was going on. Yeah. It brought kids of all races into one place. It gave jobs to thousands of people who wouldn't have had jobs, especially Mm -hmm. people of color. It generated billions and billions of dollars. It's been copied, mimicked, pieced off of. And you know, hip hop, all hip hop ever asks in return is just to show it to the world and keep creating it. You know, hip hop is very generous. It doesn't ask any, it just gives and never asks for anything back, just represent. Mm-hmm. You know, August 11th, 1973, you know, I'm going to go with what most of the guys who were there are saying. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people say, well, what about this person or what about that person? I'm going to go with the guys who were there. Mm-hmm. I actually, me and my brother were actually not in the party, but there, mm-hmm. outside. Mm-hmm. But I was seven years old. Yeah. So I don't really count. Right. But um, I'm going with that as the official birth. Yeah. birthday of hip-hop and cool herc as the father of hip-hop yeah. that's the story that i'm going with mm-hmm. and um shout out to cool herc and um it's amazing to see where hip-hop has come and in t- 50 years is a relatively short period of time it is and you know and and, and shout out to the, the pioneers that took it to levels you know it didn't go from people see hip-hop now it didn't just go from zero to a hundred mm-hmm. it took like a building each person had to put a brick 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 to now we can stand here you know there's guys on the internet dissing the dissing the uh the creators of it all i'm not gonna give that any energy but we are all standing on the shoulders of giants yeah. man. and and if it wasn't for these guys none of us would be here i wouldn't be doing what i'm doing you this interview hit, yeah. and it, none of this would be here if it wasn't on the backs of guys who did it for free, mm-hmm. yeah, who had no idea where it was going. Yeah. So I'm going to shout out all the pioneers and the people who didn't get mentioned that should get mentioned. That I don't even know about. Thank you. You know, I don't know who, who you are. Maybe I should, but thank you to them. Yeah, too. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Oh, I know. Of course, I have to ask you this. Now this is a little dicey. Is mm-hmm. your brother's KRS one? Yes. But we ask people who are their top five dead or alive. Now you you kind of have a little cheat code, but right. I'm gonna ask you anyway because I want to know who are your favorite top. Well, MCs. well, can I add Chris or am I biased? You can add him because it's not really possible not to. I, I agree with that. Yes. Okay, my top five dead or alive, and I just further I judge MCs. Not judge. I don't like to use the word judge. Mm-hmm. I rank mm-hmm. MCs based on a few things. Not just lyrical skills, but you know, it's lyrical skills, it's people who change the game. Yeah. It's it's your live show. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I know that there's a lot of trickery that goes on in the studio. Mm-hmm. And I I've been in the studio with MCs who are legendary, mm-hmm. who people consider legendary, first ballot hall of famers. And I've seen them have to piece together their mm-hmm. whole rhymes from bar to bar to bar. Their whole 16 bars took hours and hours and hours to do. And then when you hear the record, it just flows. Got it. So I like to see people live okay. to see if you can you really do what, you know, the record. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, are you really that guy? Because, yeah. you know, like if you lip syncing over the record to me, you're already trash in my yeah. opinion. Okay. I judge a few things. So based on a few things that I judge, mystique, mm-hmm. you know, originality, my top five. Okay. In no particular order. Okay. For the 80s, I'm going to go KRS-One and Rock him. Okay. To me, those are the two guys, when they came, 
they changed the game from where hip hop was at that moment creatively Mm -hmm. to where it became. Mm -hmm. Those two guys with Karis Wan with his multiple styles and Rakim with his wordplay and the flow that everyone copied. So for the 80s, those are my two. For the 90s or beyond that, I'm going to go Hove. Okay. The way I measure MCs, Mm -hmm. he's right at the, I mean, if you look across the board in every rank, I mean, there might be some guys, everyone who I mentioned might be number one at one thing. Got you. Yeah. But if you look at overall, Mm -hmm. everything, you you cannot not put him right at the top of the pile. Right. So I'm going Hove and... My 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 fourth guy is I got to put an asterisk next to his name, Notorious B.I.G. Okay, only because his career was so short, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, so he's almost like insufficient data for me. Right, because there's a number of MCs that if you just took their best three years Mm -hmm. and plucked it out, would be (laughs) among the greatest to ever do it. Right, that's true. But if you spread it out over 10 years or 15 years, you get more of a sample size. Right. So with that being said, for me, you had to have been out at least 10, 15 years to even be in this conversation. Got it. But I got to put Big in there because his three years was so impactful and Mm -hmm. incredible to the game, and he set the blueprint for how records were made from that point on. Yeah. That I'm going against my 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 rules, and I'm putting Notorious Big in my in my four. Did you ever meet him? That was my dude. Really? Yes. Wow. I have a bunch of funny stories with Big. Okay. Um, he, I met when I met Big. He had just came with, look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. Right, right, I had right. just heard that maybe once or twice. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm coming out on uptown. We had the same lawyer. Okay. So she introduced us. And he's like, you know, I'm coming out on Uptown. I just did a record with Mary J. Blige. Look up right. in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. I was like, oh, yeah. It, it, that was even vague. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah, I like that song. Yeah. And um, he said to me real quick. I know I'm going long. It's cool. Real quick. I had did a re- We had did a song on Sex and Violence album called We In There. Yep. I remember that. We in there. Yeah. 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 yeah which I produced. It okay. was the third single. And we would we mixed it just for the video, cleaned it up. But I snuck and changed the drums mm-hmm. in the in the video version because I just wanted to beef it up a little bit. So I switched and didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell Chris. Didn't tell the record company. I, didn't tell, I just snuck and changed the drums and gave it gave it to the the video guys. Okay. Nobody noticed to this day. Right. The only person who ever noticed that. What? Was a notorious B.I.G. When I mm. met him in ni- I met him in 1993. Mm-hmm. He said to me, "Yo, what's up? I want that we in there with the new drums on it." Right. That's- and I said, "Oh, how did you even wow. notice that? The nobody noticed that." Right. He was like, "Nah, like you know, he was a real hip hop head, and he wow. noticed that I changed the drums." In this, the third single off of Sex and Violence, like that that's was just crazy. Crazy, that's the that was my first meeting with Big. Right, wow. so that's your guy. All that right. was my guy. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, okay, but, but, that was my four. Okay. And my my fifth is tough because I got I really got two guys in fifth, and oh it depends God. on how I feel. Right. They flip back and forth. Okay. It's either depending on my mood, Nas. Okay. Shout out to Nas or LL Cool J, okay. who I feel is the most underrated rapper of all time. Yeah, I think when people mention great artists with longevity, mm-hmm. and I don't think he gets mentioned the yeah. way he should have. LL was rocking through multiple eras. Yeah, he was. From 85 when Run DMC was destroying exactly. everything moving. Shout out to them. LL came out like, what? I'm right. a solo artist. He was just, not just as big as them, but on a solo tip, he was the biggest solo artist. Then he he went through the Kane, KRS, Rakim era. He was dope. He went through the Ice Cube, Naughty, mm-hmm. you know, Buster era. He was yeah. dope. He went through the Wu-Tang, Jay-Z, big era. He was still on top yeah. all the way into the 2000s when when... And um, Eminem and 15 of them, he was still dope. Yeah. 
Definitely. For me, LL Cool J is the most underrated rapper of all time, and he's could be my fifth mm-hmm. or Nas, depending on if Illmatic, if I, if I happen to put that on or put right. on his, because his wordplay definitely is so ridiculous that yeah. he's. I mean, either one of them two, yeah, are are are, are my five and, and six ish. Okay, okay, yo, we gotta have you in here again. I want to ask your top five DJs, but. There's an answer to that question. Let's do it. All right, we'll we'll we'll, we'll go real quick. Yeah, let's go. I'm um, diff, di- different DJs for different things. Let's do it. As far as rocking a party, I think Kid Capri ah, is the say, best. There's I, only one answer. There's only one. <laughs> he's the best I've ever seen. Yeah. And I tell him this every time I see him. Right. I think he's the best party rocker I've ever seen. Okay. As far as the tricks, and 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 turntablism. I got DJ Scratch as my favorite all time because I've seen him do it in little clubs. I've seen him do it in Madison Square Garden. I've seen him do it everywhere. Shaky turntable, everything. You know, I've seen Scratch do do it everywhere. Okay. So that's two. As far as scratching on a record, yeah. DJ Premier okay. is the best to me to ever do it, scratching hooks and, and all that on a record. Okay. That's three. DJ in a group. Okay. I'm going JMJ. You got to go Jam yeah, Master J. Yeah, yeah, is, yeah. Is, 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 first of all, Run DMC to me. They're in a whole nother. First of all, right, you can't even rank. I don't even think they should be in any ranking. Right. I think Run DMC, when you're ranking groups or ranking things, they should be over there. Right. Facts. Because their impact to hip hop is so big, you can't even yeah. equate what they did for right. us. So they're over there. But wait. Okay. Wait. Let me stop. I got to stop. Okay. Go, 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 go. Kings lose crowns. The teachers stay intelligent. Talking big, come on, man. What, what, what were we doing back then? You know, what were Chris, we doing back Chris then? Chris took a few shots. What were we doing? Hey, let, 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 let me say this. The first person to ever play me Run DMC uh-huh. and play me Sucker MCs, and I wrote about it in the book, uh-huh. was my brother Chris. Okay. Played me Run DMC, and like, can you believe Sucker MCs? Uh-huh. He's a huge Run DMC fan. Okay. But of course, when you're hungry, yeah. and you're young and hungry, Mm-hmm. You're going at the top. Right. So Chris says some things at Run DMC. I don't know if it was at Run DMC. You know, me and Chris had this theory. This is another one. Could you show the back of that book? You see this face? This is an argument that me and Chris had. Right. <laughs> and Chris says in my philosophy, he's going to get mad at me for this, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> no. When he said, I don't walk this way to portray rein- reinforced stereotypes of today. Right. And Run DMC's biggest record was Walk This Way. Mm. One of their biggest records. Mm. He just comes out with, I don't walk this way to portray yeah. ignorance. Mm. Just, and I was like, yo, you just dissed Run DMC right. again. Right. His argument was, no, I did not diss Run DMC. I'm just saying, I don't walk this way to portray or reinforce stereotypes today. And I'm like, nah, Chris, you're splicing hairs right now. Right. And hence that face. Right, right. <clears throat> That's the argument that we would have. Like, nah, man. You said I don't walk this way. Talking chicken and watermelon. Oh. Talking brokerage English and drugs. Oh. I felt like you were insinuating. But he always says I was not. I was just saying I don't. And, run, and DMC did say something about eating chicken. and I, I, I like to eat chicken and collard greens. Mm. And here he come with, I don't eat chicken. Like, it's a whole. I didn't even catch that. Now, uh, I, I was like, days. yo. <laughs> and, Chris, but, and Chris's defense. First of all, this is my opinion, not KRS. Okay. KRS's opinion is I was not dissing. Okay. Okay. Run DMC's opinion and mine was <laughs> <laughs> he was he was dissing. <laughs> So, but to say, I say all that to say, Chris is a huge Run DMC fan, yeah. and he said that many times. You gotta be, and and you know, for us, Run DMC are the Beatles yeah. of hip hop for, for me, mm-hmm. and they are above reproach in mm-hmm. in my eyes. That's a fact. So, um, yeah, this is a young hungry kid. JMJ was young, hun- yeah, but JMJ, JMJ was JMJ such a great was guy. Oh, hey, that was my fourth. That was my fourth DJ, yeah. Jam Master J, and five. I'm going with for me. The greatest radio DJ ever. I know. For me, 
There's it's cool one. DJ Red, yeah, Alert, Red Alert, BDP member, my inspiration. Yeah. I love you, Red, and I talk about him a lot in the book, and just a great guy. We've been trying to get Red up here for the longest time. Come on, Red. We need you. Come we on, need Red. you to talk. I mean, what are we doing? He's, he he's broke. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever, ever met. Yeah. He was nothing but nice to me from day one, and yeah. he broke so many songs. Mm-hmm. He was, if he played your record, everybody in New York City, shout out to Marley Mall as well on BLS. Yeah, yeah. Everybody in New York City was listening to him and Chuck Chill Out. And if Red Alert played your song, it you were a star, man. Yeah. He made BDP because he played the South Bronx. Mm-hmm. Marley Mall wouldn't, wasn't going to yeah, play that record. Yeah. Chris, this is, he played the bridges over. He made BDP what it is today. And shout out to Red Alert. Yeah. Okay, I got one more question. You Let's know, go. You know, you know, so... How did you feel when the song South Bronx came out? But y'all had spent so much time in other places. How did how did this well come this anthem? You know, it's funny. Two things. One is that first of all, I'm a Brooklyn guy through and through. Right. Born in Brooklyn. I went to high school in Brooklyn. Shout out to Abraham Lincoln High School. Um, but Chris who left home at an early age, found himself as a teenager in the Bronx. Gotcha. So his formative years was back in the Bronx. Got it. So by the time BDP was formed, he was a Bronx dude. Got it. Even though we lived in Brooklyn a large majority of our lives, mm-hmm. we were in the Bronx for the creation of hip hop. Mm-hmm. Then we went to Brooklyn and I stayed, but he went to the Bronx and became KRS-One. Mm-hmm. Two... Quick trivia, you know the song Brooklyn's in the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, KRS helped write that song. Really? Yes, he he helped write that song with yeah. Cutmaster DC. Wow. Okay. Before he even came out. Yeah. So the same guy who wrote South Bronx <laughs> helped write Brooklyn's in the house. So that's yeah. just crazy, that's crazy to me. Just quick trivia. Oh, I love those little stories. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah. So I I love South Bronx, and a lot of people. Say to me, you know, I'm a Bronx dude because people just, you know, I'm mm-hmm. being BDP. I'm a Bronx guy. But yeah. really, I'm Brooklyn all day. Yeah. BK all day, Flatbush. Yeah. You know, but, but that, that's you know, this is what it is. Yo, man, I just want to say, man, everybody, please buy this book. Please. Shout out to Rose D as well, who helped shape and form this book. Yes. And we'll get her in here too because we have some talking to do. But you won't be disappointed. I promise. I promise you, you will you will not be disappointed. Thank this you. This is an amazing book, and it's really inspirational too. Thank you. And it's compelling, and I love how different y'all are, but how much y'all love each other yeah. and show that, and your camaraderie is crazy. I, you know, can, can I say something real quick? Yeah. When I when I decided to write the book, I had to get permission from Chris because I I said to him, I said, yo. I want to write the story, but I want to tell everything. Mm-hmm. I want to really get into it and tell everything. But, you know, you have a 30-year crafted career of how people know you. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to say anything that you would feel as embarrassing or, you know, yeah. that would hurt your career. Yeah. And, you know, his exact words were, I don't give a fuck. Right. Tell it all. Right. Don't forget this. Right. Don't forget right. this. Don't forget. So once yeah. he said that and gave me the, the green light. Yeah. I said I told everything. Everything yeah. I, I let it. I let it. Rip. There's a very intimate details about KRS yes. and you. Yes. But KRS, you're like, yo, KRS did that. Why he did that? The yes. bully part was like, yo, word. You yes. know all of that. It's in here. It's in here. So you really want to learn about both of them, but also, you know, I'm not giving anything away though. I'm not giving anything away. You just gotta grab it. Amazon. It's on. It's, it's in, on. A- yo, you're in Walt, 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 Walt Target, I think. Well, yeah, on pizza talk. Well, we're we're on, we're, we're on Target.com. We're yeah. on Apple Music. Yeah. Uh, Kindle. Kindle. Amazon. You can get it. Amazon's the easiest place to get it. We're coming into bookstores now. We're in some bookstores. I, I would say Amazon is the easiest way to get it. But mm-hmm. anywhere where you order books, my brother's name is Kenny, is there. Yeah. Uh, please check it out. I just want everybody to read the story. Get the book. Give it to a friend after you read it. I just want everybody to read it because I want to inspire people. Definitely. Shout out, man. Thank you so much, Thank you bro. so much for having me. It's been a long time coming, yeah, my brother. Yeah, I know, I know. It's been so yes, long. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. All right.